Magic is what I've experienced here at Open Sauce, and this is Taylor. Hey, Taylor. Hi, nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet you too. Computed axial lithography. Yes, it's, it's a magical technique. It's what's called a volumetric process. So most 3D printing processes build up layer by layer. I'm very familiar with those. Yes, obviously. of course. Yeah. Um, we do something a little magic. We do volumetric printing. So we form every part of our geometry all at once. Because it happens, we print very, very fast because we're forming the whole part at once. Right, you're doing it. And it's not like, okay, traditional additive, if we think about an FFF process, we're forming the first layer and we're going up in Z or Z. Mm -hmm. You were just like, I'm just going to print it all at once. Yep, it's just going to be there. We're just going to form it. So for example, I have a little space shuttle in here. This was made in 20 seconds. Tw 20 seconds? 20 seconds. So we don't need time to, you know, like move the layer up or like start the next one because we just do everything at once. So everything is very fast. It's a, it is a viscous resin that's been oxygenated mm -hmm. and it spins as a projector is throwing 2D images with 3D information in it. Yes, yes, it's actually pretty simple in concept. There, there's three main parts of it. So our first one is our material. It's a it's a viscous material because we don't have any support structures. So we're printing in the material, and the support is the liquid itself. The liquid is the support. So it has to be viscous enough to be support. Yep, yep. So it's like okay. m molasses. And there's a way to get around that, but we can talk about it just later. That's a little <laughs> interesting. Um, and so the next component is very simple. That was just rotation. We're just rotating it. And then the third one is the projector. So that's all we need for hardware is just material, rotation, projector. Those are the three things. That seems really simple right? for this, what se but it seems like a very advanced process because I can't, I'm having a hard time think of, thinking about how you're doing 2D projection with 3D information and building a volume at once. Yeah. You know, my, my heart and soul is in the additive process, which historically has been something that is additive. It is added to, it's almost like a tesseract. It's it's the it's the three D representation of four D space. Yes, it's kind of like that. Yeah, it's the two D representation of three D space. There so we go. Okay. That's where all our magic comes into is the projection, the actual image that we're putting into this file, and that's very similar to medical imaging techniques. So at the core of this technology was called tomography. That's the core of the CT scan. Oh. We we kind of describe it as a CT scan in reverse. So we're starting with like a theoretical model, and where they're moving it into three D space. In CT, you have oh. a three D person and you're going to like a 3D model. It sort of helps a little bit, but it's still really weird to have to like bend my brain around it just a little bit. Yeah, because we, we think in 2D space with additive manufacturing all the time. So you look at this and like people keep asking us, so you're like, oh, you like, you make it from the in out or like you're making layers. We're like, no, we're truly printing every, we're giving the proper dosage to start making this part at every part of its geometry. It's really getting formed all at once. T, L gray, decaf. Now you said 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Obviously, this is a a small volume here. Sure. How big do you think this can go? Sure. So the biggest we've done so far is in a six-inch diameter vial, and we've made parts about four to five inches in there, and that's still very quick. We made those in about uh, I think two minutes, but we theorized that we could go up to half a meter to a meter. And like I said, everything scales pretty uniformly, except for the time. It still stays pretty low. We have to increase our projector power a little bit. We have more liquid. We have to calibrate it a little bit more but we could probably make like, let's say a 0.3 meter part and still probably like three or four minutes. Three or four minutes? It's still fast, because once again, everywhere is getting the dosage at once. So no matter how big or small, everywhere in there is still getting the light dosage to start polymerizing. This is amazing. It's, it's magic, I still can't believe it. I mean, I've worked with this for like two or three years now and I still can't believe it works. Now you're at UC Berkeley, right? We're, we're yeah, we're a research group out of UC Berkeley. Uh, we're a mechanical engineering lab, there's about eight of us and uh, more undergrads. This started with Professor Hayden Taylor. He's a really great guy. Um, the first paper and kind of research with this came out in 2019. So it's a pretty new process too. I would love to come by and see your lab. Yeah, we do really fascinating stuff here. So the one we have today is just one aspect of what we do there. So this is actually a, almost like a space printer. We tested this in zero gravity. So like I mentioned before, um, the part has to be supported by viscous material. But what if you want to use low viscosity material? Um, the one easy answer to that is to get rid of gravity because you don't have any buoyancy effects. Things won't sink or, fl <laughs> sink or float. So we actually tested this on the Vomit Comet. And we, this is one of the 3D prints we printed in 20 seconds on the Vomit Comet. And this, That's fascinating! It, it's a space shuttle we made in zero gravity. But the cool thing about this is that this could only be made in zero gravity. So you're sure, okay, so this is a less viscous liquid. This is like almost like the viscosity of water. So we're getting oh, pretty okay. close to SLA. So I, we tried to print this in Earth gravity and it just started to rise. It same had, viscosity. Same viscosity, same image, same everything. 
it started to like solidify and it actually was really hot so it started to rise okay um but same parts same everything printed in zero gravity it's right there so this is this part right there was only made possible by zero gravity but one other interesting aspect out about it is the materials so we can print you know these are kind of hard acrylic materials over there these are a little bit softer plastics used in like medical implants, like knee implants. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we can also print biomaterials. That's a really big aspect of this because in normal bioprinting, if you have to do extrusion based, you can actually like tear the gels or tear any cells in this. I'm actually, I'm actually familiar with that because we highlighted that one time and the, uh, the, the bioprinting is fascinating, but again, it's a tiny needle in a tiny space. Yeah, you run the risk of tearing it. You have to be very careful. But with us, like I said, we have no movement. The parts just forming in there all at once. So this is very, very good for bioprinting. And then there's another interesting aspect on that um, that will actually be related to the space aspect is that our sister lab, so we invented this process. It was UC Berkeley and Lawrence Livermore Lohr Labs that invented this process. Um, I got a grant from NASA to test this on the space station in about two years, which is very exciting. What? The goal with that is that they're going to 3D print organs just experimentally at first, but the long-term goal is you would have organs made in space and brought back down to Earth with this process, which is very exciting. I could have space organs inside me. You could have space organs inside you, which would be very exciting one day. And I don't think that's too far off. I think I'm geeking out about that just a little bit. Isn't that really cool? really cool? Yeah, NASA's done some really cool initiatives like what can you make in space and use back on Earth? And bioprinting is just a huge one of them. And it's the same process, same thing. So it's very cool to see that. Okay, this is, this is fascinating, obviously. And we're going to want to find out more about this. We'll do our best to travel down at some point because everybody's going to want to see it. But Look right there and tell everybody where they can go to find out more information about this. Sure. So if you look up UC Berkeley Computed Axial Lithography, it's a little bit complicated, but that will go for our lab. There's also a Designing for Nano Manufacturing UC Berkeley. That's our website. You'll be able to find all our papers. We are making this open source. There is a GitHub link on there as well. Right now, mostly the software is on there, but about six months from now, this will all be completely open source. People will be able to get a parts list to start making these printers themselves. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, listen, if you made this fire awesome, don't forget to hug each other more. Fight for cause you believe in. Print at zero G. And as always, high five. There it is.